my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Ergo Baby. Founded in 2003, Ergo Baby has pioneered the gold standard for comfortable, ergonomic, soft structured carriers. Ergo Baby is dedicated to helping families bond, grow, and thrive by creating premium baby products where function and quality are not compromised. Ergo Baby has created a broad range of award winning baby carriers, strollers, swaddlers, nursing pillows, and related products that fit into families' daily lives seamlessly, comfortably, and safely. In 2020, they launched Everlove by Ergo Baby, a first of its kind baby carrier buyback and resale program, a sustainability effort to support families and the planet. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Brandy all about Ergo Baby and Everlove by Ergo Baby. I also want to say a big thank you to all of our listener supporters via Patreon. Patreon is a platform to help you support the creators that you love. And for just $5 a month, you can support the birth hour and get access to special perks like our private Facebook group, our archived episodes, and bonus content each month. We also now have an annual membership option that comes with a free month. You can find out more at patreon.com slash birth hour or thebirthhour.com slash support. Today's guest is Taylor. Taylor's going to be sharing a cesarean birth as well as two VBAC birth stories. One of her VBACs was during a wildfire evacuation, and her and her husband are both firefighters. So I thought this would be a really relevant story for right now, as so many people on the West Coast of the United States are facing wildfires during this time. Hi, Taylor. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell listeners a little bit about you and your family before we get into your stories? Sure. My name is Taylor. I am 34 years old and I live in Fort McMurray, Alberta, Canada. And if you don't know where that is, it's pretty far north. Um, I live with my husband and my three crazy boys. I'm a firefighter paramedic full time and so is my husband. And I've actually created my own business. I kind of have like a whole bunch of different things that I do uh, from prenatal education to I'm a doula, I'm an IBCLC and a few other things. Um, And so that takes up a good chunk of my time as well. And um, I'm a birth nerd. So (laughs) I definitely love your podcast. Oh, thank you. It sounds like you are a busy mama. (laughs) Um, Very. All right. Well, we're going to hear all three stories today. So let's start with your first pregnancy and how that went for you. Yeah. So I'm one of those people that have wanted to have a baby in my belly since I was a little girl. Um, so as soon as my husband and I got pregnant, I was like, okay, let's have a baby. Let's do this. And my friends were all having babies around the same time. Um, and I found that all of my friends were just getting pregnant like right away. And here I was, you know, we were trying and trying like so hard to get pregnant and it just wasn't happening. So, um, I did go through a period of time where I felt disappointed. Like, why is this not happening? I'm young and I'm healthy. And looking back on it now, it really wasn't that long at all. It took me about four months to get pregnant. And when I finally got pregnant, I was so, so excited to tell my husband. Um, We went out for a meal and I had the wait staff right on his plate that it said, Randy, you're going to be a daddy. And then they put his food on top of it. So as he was starting to eat his meal, he was like, what is on my plate? And then he saw the words and we were super, super excited. I bet that was fun for the restaurant staff too. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And my pregnancy was pretty, um, pretty easy, uh, around, I think it was 11 or 12 weeks. I had a subchronic hematoma. So, um, as a first time mom, of course, I was like, you know, pretty nervous about it when I saw some bleeding and had a tiny bit of cramping. So I went to the hospital, they did an ultrasound, let me know, what it was and that it should resolve on its own and to just go about my life normally. And sure enough, it did. 
Um, yeah, I continued to work on the fire department and, um, I do suffer greatly from, uh, migraines when I'm pregnant. Um, and so that was new to me with my first baby and trying to navigate that, um, cause they, they would get like very, very, very bad to the point where I couldn't see, I would almost have stroke like symptoms. And so it was a little bit scary, but other than that, my pregnancy was perfect. I'm one of those people who just loves being pregnant. So had you planned for, um, a certain type of birth? Were you a birth nerd at that point or did that come later? No, I wasn't. So being a medical professional, um, like we took a prenatal class and before having my own baby, I've actually delivered, uh, quite a few babies. And so my husband and I thought, Oh, we got this. Like, we'll take a class just to say we did it, you know? And, um, I just assumed like, I didn't, I didn't read many books. I didn't practice any coping mechanisms. I thought, Oh, ba- people have babies all the time. And, um, I planned on having an OB because at the time that was the only option here in Fort McMurray is we only have, um, four OBs and we have quite a few babies being born every day here. So it was my only option. Um, and so I had planned on a hospital birth with an OB. Um, and here we don't meet our OB until you're around 37 weeks. So I had only met my OB once before I went into labor. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, all right. Well, do you want to go ahead and talk about how labor started for you? Yeah. So I was 38 weeks pregnant. It was the springtime and, um, it was actually April fool's day. So that night at like two minutes to midnight, so it was still April fool's day. My, we were laying in bed, going to sleep, and I felt this huge pop and just this movie style gush of fluid in the bed. And I whipped the covers over and I am like, Oh my God, Randy, my water just broke. And he goes, ha ha ha, April fools, you got me. I was like, no, no, my water legit broke. Like it's happening. And, um, I got up and I was like, so nervous, but excited that I was like, I was shaking and I was like, Oh my God, what do we do? And so we went to the hospital and a nurse checked me. She confirmed that my water had broken. Um, I was only one centimeter dilated. She didn't tell me anything other than that, like if baby was even engaged or if my cervix was effaced. Um, she didn't really give me much information other than that I was one centimeter and to go home and come back in 12 hours. So we went home. I tried my best to sleep, but I was just too excited that I really didn't get much sleep that night. Um, the next day we ate a breakfast and at this point I wasn't having contractions. It was just my water had broken. So Um, after breakfast, we went shopping and then made our way to the hospital and, um, we were admitted. And at that point they, they didn't really, they didn't explain anything to me. And now in hindsight, being the person that I am with the knowledge I have, it, it's something that, um, still bothers me to this day. Um, but they didn't explain anything. They didn't go over any options. They just said, here, get dressed in this gown and sit down on this bed and someone will be in to see you. Um, so the OB came in and he checked me and he said that I was two centimeters, um, and that my water had broken, no contractions. Um, and he went ahead and did a sweep without telling me he was going to do it. Um, which can be extremely painful. So I wasn't mentally prepared for that either. Um, and he gave me the gel to ripen the cervix, which now I know is actually a contraindication if your water has already broken. Um, but they went ahead and did that 
And then another hour went by and they came in and they started me on a Pitocin drip. But again, at the time, I had no idea what they were doing. I thought it was just IV fluid. No one told me anything. Um, And then they left me and my husband in that room. And immediately I was having some serious, very intense contractions. And going from having no contractions to these very intense contractions that were coming on every two to three minutes was hard mentally to, um, to kind of get, get around that and to get on top of it and, and be able to mentally and physically cope. So, um, I struggled. I really, really struggled. I remember sitting on a birth ball and hanging on to the edge of the bed, um, and try my best to breathe. But I was just so tense because I hadn't, my body hadn't been given a chance to like even realize what's happening. Um, so I, I labored like that, um, very intense pain, just kind of gripping the side of the bed. My husband, poor guy, didn't really know what to do to help me. Um, and I finally reached around five centimeters. Um, and this was probably now around um, three o'clock or so. Um, and I asked for the epidural. Uh, so they came in, they did my epidural. It did take a few tries for them to get it. I think it took three in total. After that, I was like, oh my gosh, this is magical. I feel great. Um, but again, just left, just left us. Said, okay, you're good now and left us. And I didn't have doula, I didn't have any extra support or the knowledge. So I just laid there in the bed. Looking back now, um, I know that my baby was sunny side up. And um, I was having extreme, extreme, before I got the epidural, I was having this extreme back pain, the back labor that you hear about that's associated with an OP facing baby. Um, And also, again, now knowing what I know, I wish I had tried different positions to help him, you know, navigate my pelvis and I didn't. So I just laid back in my bed with my epidural, uh, for hours and hours and hours during that time, the OB came in and he said to me, don't worry, I'm good with a scalpel. And Uh. yeah, I know it's, it's cringeworthy. It's so bad. Um, I was like, uh, as a medical professional, it's not okay to say something like that. And, and now just thinking about the psychology that surrounds birth, Mm -hmm. um, how dare he say something like that when I'm only five centimeters, like how would he be able to predict that I would need a C-section? And it was just, it was very, um, demeaning as well. Like, Mm -hmm. so I was, I was also put off by that. And mentally, I think that played a part in my whole story. Um, and then he left at some point and, and things are a little vague for me because I should have mentioned this is my oldest son and he is now just over six years old. So this was six years ago. Mm -hmm. It was probably around, nine o'clock at at night and my epidural started to what I thought was it started to not work anymore because initially I felt amazing. Like I couldn't feel anything really. And then it started to become a little one-sided. So I kind of would shift my weight and, and tried to make a difference that way. Um, but I think a big part of what people, don't warn you about with an epidural is it takes away the contraction pain, but it doesn't take away the pressure. And sometimes pressure can associate as, as pain. And so I think that's a big part of what I was feeling was this immense pressure in my pelvis and, and it hurt. Um, so I thought, okay, wait a second, my epidural is not working anymore. Um, because I can, I can feel pain. Um, and no one, no one explained to me the difference there. Um, and so around 10 o'clock at night, 
the nurses became concerned with his heart rate. Um, I'm assuming, like, again, nothing was explained to us, but I'm assuming that they were noticing D cells that were alarming and not rebounding the way that they should. Um, so they did start talking about a C-section. They checked me and I was eight centimeters. So I was so close and I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm so close. Like as if I can't just make it a little bit further. Um, but they, they said, no, this is the best option for you because of the baby's heart rate. Um, and again, as a first time mom, I didn't, I put my full trust in, in the staff, um, and, you know, medical professional to a medical professional. I just trusted that they had my best interests at heart. And so we agreed, we said, okay, this is the way this is meant to happen. Um, I guess we'll be having a C-section. So they talked us through everything. They told my husband he would be able to come. They gave him some scrubs. And as he was changing within like 10 minutes, all of a sudden things got much more serious. Um, instead of us talking casually about me having a C-section, it was like people were frantically moving around. Um, they were like wheeling me out and saying, we have to go now. No one told me anything. Just, I just knew that all of a sudden things were much more serious. So we got outside of the OR doors and I kept telling them that, that I could, that I was in pain. And so again, I, it was pressure that I was feeling. It wasn't, um, like the actual pain of the contractions. So they assumed that my epidural wasn't working anymore. Um, so outside of the doors, I remember just bawling my eyes out. I could barely speak. They said that my husband couldn't come in the room anymore, that they were going to have to put me under general. And they wanted me to spell out my name and my birth date. And I couldn't because I was so beside myself. I couldn't, you know, when you're crying, like <laughs> I just couldn't get it out. And I remember a nurse grabbed me and she said, pull yourself together. You need to tell us your name and birthday. And so I got it out. They wheeled me in. My husband was just left there. No one stayed with him. No one told him what was happening. Nothing. Um, I went in and I just remember it being mm, the scariest moment of my life. They grabbed both my arms and tied them down crucifix style. Um, the OB who had before said he was great with a knife was, uh, yelling at the nursing staff. Um, some iodine even hit me in the face as they were spraying it on my belly. Um, and next thing I know there was a mask on my face. No one said, okay, you know, we're going to put you to sleep now. It was just mask on my face. And that was it. And I remember the last moment I thought was, am I going to die? Like, is this the end for me? And then I was just out. Um, yeah. Sorry. Were you going to say something? No, I'm just, just processing it. And I feel like you've done a really good job of explaining how being a medical professional yourself made you even more aware. I don't know if in the moment or if in hindsight of how like not okay, a lot of this was. Yeah. I think my redeeming birth, but also being a medical professional has really opened my eyes. Mm. Um, yeah. And and the reason I know that oh, this stuff was done is because years later, I went to uh, records in the hospital and I paid for my record mm. because I was like, what happened to me? Like, what happened? Yeah. And I was like, I need to know. So I went and I paid for my records. Yeah. So after he was born, they gave him to my husband to do skin to skin and I woke up in recovery by myself and I just remember feeling like really sick, nauseous. They gave me morphine and I don't do well on morphine. Um, and I felt sick. I, I tried to sit up because I needed to puke 
and I couldn't sit up because I had just had a C-section and no one was there. So I just kind of turned my head to the side and got sick. It was quite some time. It was, you know, when someone has a C-section, it's usually, you know, an hour or two before they get to see their baby if they have gone to recovery alone. Um, but because I was put under general, it was much longer. It was closer to five or six hours. Wow. And where was your husband? Was he still with the baby? Yeah, he was with the baby. The poor guy. He didn't he didn't know to put gloves on the baby. And so the first time I saw my baby's face, he, his face was just scratched, like <laughs> just like looked like something really bad had happened to him. And my husband's like, I'm sorry, I just didn't know what to do. <laughs> um, and so when I got wheeled up, I remember kind of half being the, like present and half like not being present. Cause I was so high on morphine. Um, I remember them, Randy holding out the baby, look, going, look, he's here. And then, and then I have these vague memories of being like, oh yeah. And then passing out, um, high on morphine. And then I woke up again and I saw the nurse holding my breast and trying to make him breastfeed. And then I passed out again. And so when I finally became like lucid and the morphine had left my system. I was like, wait a sec, like how much time has gone by? Did he breastfeed or did I dream that? Like, did someone put him on my breast? And I, like, I understand the intent there that they were trying to help and that they knew I wanted to breastfeed, but I'm, I'm not sure I'm okay with them holding my baby to my breast and me breastfeeding, but not actually being awake. It just doesn't seem right to me. Um, and so that was kind of my immediate postpartum. I was in the hospital for three days, um, which is typical here in most places, I think after you have a Mm C-section, um, yeah. So that's, that's the birth of yeah. my first son. So I imagine that your recovery w- was hard. <laughs> that's just my take from that story, but tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it was. And I didn't really have anything to compare it to, Yeah, but, um, like you don't realize how much you use your core for mm-hmm. until you've had it cut open. Um, like I needed my husband to help me sit. I needed him to pass me the baby to breastfeed. Um, it, it was, it was a struggle. Like it's, it's definitely, um, uncomfortable for sure. Especially now that I have something else to compare it to. Yeah. Um, breastfeeding is something I, I wanted to chat about, um, I struggled with my first and I, I naively thought that it was kind of easy. Like I watched YouTube videos. I was like, okay, how hard can this actually be? And at first he latched and, and he would go on. Um, but after a couple of days, um, my nipples were physically damaged, um, like pretty extensively and it hurt so bad that I would get like nervous diarrhea before I knew I was going to have to feed him. Like I would get that nervous about the pain that I'd have to go use the washroom first. Um, and after a few days, it would even become difficult to get him to latch. Like he would cry and cry and push away at my breast. And I was like, okay, how do I get it in his mouth if he's pushing away and, and then I would get in his mouth and I would like almost contort my body to however I finally got him latched. I'd be like, okay, now I can't move because he's on. And I would just endure this awful, awful pain because I was just so happy he finally got on. Um, and about five days postpartum, um, actually I should go back a bit in the hospital. I had zero help with nursing zero. I had one nurse tell me, let the baby sleep as long as he wants. 
And then I would have another nurse tell me, no, no, you need to feed him more often. So I just didn't have any, like, it just, the conflicting advice really confused me as a new mom. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And they're nurses. They should know. So which one do I listen to? Um, and so he probably slept a little more than he should have. I probably didn't feed him quite frequently enough. And then five days postpartum, he started to get orange crystals in his diaper, um, which means that, which can mean that he's become dehydrated. So, um, I went into emerge and they told me he was severely dehydrated and that I needed to give him formula. And that was the advice I got. And I was like, okay, okay. So on our way home, we stopped and got formula. And again, like looking back, I think, oh my gosh, I wish I had an older me just like sitting on the younger me's shoulder telling myself what to do. Um, but I, so we got the formula and I, I didn't even think like, oh, his stomach is probably really tiny. Um, I just thought, oh, these pre-made little bottles, that looks pretty small. So I gave it to him and he, he chugged the whole thing, which was way too much for a five day old baby. And I was so happy that he had just eaten. Cause I, at this, now I felt so guilty. I was like, oh my God, I dehydrated my baby and they made me feel bad. Um, and so I, I did feel bad. And I think it's almost natural to feel those feelings when you're supposed to be feeding your baby and it's your main job after you give birth. And here I was trying so hard, but I couldn't. And he was dehydrated. So I fed him that bottle and then he puked it all up because it was clearly too much, his poor little stomach. And I was just in tears. I was like, Oh my God, no, I can't, I can't even bottle feed my baby. Right. Like what's happening. Um, and that went on for a while. I, I, I feel like I'm a fairly resourceful person. So I eventually just kind of figured out how to make this work on my own. Um, I used a nipple shield. I went to public health to see lactation support people, um, three times. And all of them told me I had lots of milk and that his latch looked fine. And not one person looked inside his mouth. Um, I went to the pediatrician. I had, um, my husband even brought home a strange lady that I have never met before. He bumped into her buying a nipple shield in the drugstore and she came home with him offering to help me. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, uh, you know, I think it was six days postpartum naked. And my husband walks into the nursery and he's like, I have this lady, I found this lady and she says she can help you and bless her heart. Just like everyone else had these good intentions, but was zero help to me. <laughs> um, so all these people that I went to for help and no one ever actually helped me. Um, so I resorted to a nipple shield, which helped with the pain. Um, but because of our struggles and like now with my IBCLC, um, knowledge, I know exactly what happened, but I didn't then. And so I would nurse with the nipple shield. And then after I would nurse, I would then pump both breasts and then after I pumped, I would give him a top-up bottle of whatever pumped milk I could get, as well as a little bit of formula. And so I did that triple feed scenario for an entire year. Um, and it worked. It worked. And I, I look back on that time um, as special in its own way. Um, but the lack of support is what really gets me. And when my son turned four years old, after I had taken a tethered oral tissues course in the States, um, I became very interested in tongue ties and lip ties as becoming more of a specialty, you know, in my IBCLC practice. And sure enough, he had a like 90% tongue tie, like so bad that as a four-year-old, it was affecting his teeth. Um, so we had it taken care of at that age, but just looking at it, I was like, oh my gosh, all the trouble that this little 
tissue had caused me and no one saw it. And it was like clear as day. It was clear as day. It wasn't one that's hard to find. It was like right there. And not one person out of all of those people I went to see, did anyone notice and point it out to me and, you know, give me some actual help. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) well, that's my first. Yeah. Um, okay. So how much time went by before you found out you were pregnant again? Um, I tried to follow the recommendations or at least the old recommendations of, uh, spacing out your pregnancies after you've had a Mm C-section and, oh gosh, now thinking back, I think it was around 13. 14, 14 months that I waited and then I got pregnant again with my second. Okay. And at that point, had you done more like birth related research and whatnot? Surprisingly, not really. I looked into getting a doula this time. I knew that I wanted to have a VBAC, a vaginal birth after C-section. So mm-hmm. I did a lot of research based on having a VBAC and having more support. But again, and you'd think my, my redeeming birth, I would try to figure out how to better cope and all of these other options and things I could have researched, but I, I didn't in Fort McMurray still at this time. Um, we only had the four OBs and, and so my only option was a hospital birth with an OB. Um, and so that's, the, the route that I had, I had planned on. Was it the Um, same situation where you didn't meet the person until the very end? Uh, actually for some reason they classified me as high risk because, (laughs) because I was a previous C-section, which doesn't seem quite right to me, but I, I saw him more regularly, which I was totally okay with. Yeah. So this pregnancy went great. Uh, again, the migraines, which, um, were really hard for me cause I would get about two of them a week. But other than that, um, I loved being pregnant again. It was amazing. Um, whenever I would go into my OB appointments, he would ask me, Oh, I see we haven't scheduled your C-section. We need to schedule that. And I'd say, no, no. Remember I told you I'm going to have a VBAC and he would mock me and say, he would laugh and smirk and say, okay, sure. And he'd wink at me. Um, and this was a, this was a different OB than the, than the first. So, um, I was disappointed again with the care I was receiving, but I didn't really have many options. So, um, I would just, it, we would just go through that every time I went, no, I'm having a V back. And he would joke that it probably wasn't going to happen. And then I started to look into getting a doula that kind of leads me right up to about 38 weeks pregnant. Um, our city, um, was hit by a large wildfire. Um, my husband and I are both firefighters here in the city. So I was at work and it was very strange. I had come home for lunch and the sky, you know how the sky kind of looks eerie right before a bad storm? Mm-hmm. It, it looked like that, and, but there was no storm coming. My husband and I, I stood out on the street and I said, what is happening? Like, it looks weird outside. And then I went to work and no one was in the fire hall. And I was like, what? I have this like gut feeling something's wrong. Um, and then all of a sudden everyone started flooding into the fire hall. I, at that point, didn't really know what was happening, just that there was a wildfire. And so they were asking me to load up fire hose. So here I am with my 38 week pregnant belly carrying fire hose and putting it into the truck and getting them all set to go. And then finally someone grabbed me and they said, Taylor, you have to get out of here. Like you have to leave. The city is on fire. And I was like, what? Holy shit. I was like, uh, okay. So I drove home as fast as I could. I think like way too fast, uh, got home. And I told my husband, I said, Randy, the city's on fire. We're being evacuated. And he was like, what? No. I was like, yeah, yeah. Things are happening here. Like we got to go. 
And, um, it was a very strange situation. We ended up staying at home probably too long. Um, and a lot of people here in Fort McMurray did just because there was no like alarm that let everyone know to leave. It was all word of mouth. Um, and so we packed up everything we could and I had my two year old at the time and my dog and we, we started to leave and Randy was torn because his, you know, he had a duty to stay and fight the fire with our brothers and our sisters on the fire department. Um, and I was like, yeah, but you also have a duty to me and you can't leave me. Um, because just to kind of give everyone a picture, Fort McMurray is like up North and there's, there's like one highway that leads South to Edmonton, Alberta, which is the nearest city. And there's pretty much nothing in between Fort McMurray and Edmonton, like no major hospitals, nothing. And that's about a five hour drive on one straight highway. So me being 38 weeks pregnant and having had my only birth experience, a C-section, I was like, yeah, but what if I go into labor on my way to Edmonton and I have the bit, like, what if I die on my way to Edmonton g- giving birth, like on my own with our toddler in the vehicle. I, and I just, I couldn't fathom it. So I said, I'm sorry, but you have to come with me. Like you can't stay here. Um, so we started to drive away. And as we were driving away, my belly was just, just a move in. Um, I could see the baby's like elbows and arms and everything. And it's because I was just so stressed Um, I usually handle stress very well, especially with my line of work being what it is. But, um, as we were leaving, you could, I could see the city on fire, like behind me and we hadn't prepared. So we didn't, our vehicle had no fuel in it and there was no fuel left in the city. So, uh, at one point my husband had to leave me in the traffic jam, um, and run back to our house to siphon fuel out of our out of our ATV so that we could make it as far as we could down the highway away from the fire. Um, and it was scary because there was 80,000 people had to be evacuated out of a very small city with only two roads leading away. Um, (laughs) yeah, it, it was very, it was, um, it was scary. And about one third of, of the city burnt, which is Mm. quite a bit. Um, but I made it, I made it. And then I, my husband dropped me off at a friend's house in Edmonton. And then he went right back, uh, to Fort McMurray to fight the fire. And the very next day I got a phone call from a midwife in Edmonton. And she said, I would love to take you on as my client. And I said, Oh my God, yes, please. Thank you. (laughs) Um, how did she find you? I don't know. People were pouring out, reaching out to me, asking me if I needed somewhere to live, if I needed clothes. Um, The surrounding communities really pulled together to help all of the evacuees from Fort McMurray. It was truly amazing. Mm. So I had my first appointment with my midwife and I was, I I remember I sat on the couch and her and her student just kind of sat there and they were just chatting with me. And I was like, this is so weird. (laughs) Um, I was like, are you, don't you have something to do? Like, am I wasting your time? And they're like, no, no, this is what we do. (laughs) I was like, oh, okay. So I'll just sit here. And they're like, yeah, we just, we talk and then we'll check the baby's heart rate and we'll talk about your wishes and stuff. And I just, it was so different than what I had been used to, I was, I was just like, Oh man, this is so strange, but it was great. And she was very supportive of my VBAC wishes, which was very different than the attitude I was receiving from the OB in Fort McMurray. Um, so I was super excited about that. And during one of my appointments, she told me that my baby was OP. So yet another sunny side up baby, Um, but she didn't really tell me kind of what that meant really just that baby's facing up. And she told me I could try, I could Google spinning babies and kind of left it at that. Um, 
So I didn't really do anything active to try to get him to move into a better position because I didn't really understand what that meant. Like I didn't know that an OP baby can sometimes be more difficult to labor or that they had sometimes have trouble engaging into the pelvis. Um, so I just was kind of like, Oh, well, whatever. I don't know what that means, but I'll just continue on with life. Um, and so during those two weeks, I had to find a place to live, um, because I couldn't live in my friend's spare room with my toddler and a new baby and my dog and my husband when he did get a chance to come see me. Um, so it was a stressful two weeks being pregnant and not having any family around and not having anywhere to live. Um, but a few days before my water broke, I did find a house to rent and, um, I spent those few days nesting. I even printed off pictures of our family and I like just put them on posters and put them up in this rental house just so it felt a little bit like a home. Yeah. So that's pretty much my, my pregnancy with that one. All right. Well, let's hear how this birth went. (laughs) Yeah. So my contractions started, I think it was around 10 AM and my husband was just set to go back up to Fort McMurray to continue with the wildfire efforts. And I had never felt a, a, a natural contraction before. So I thought, um, like, Oh, I think this might be it. I don't know. So I told him, I think you need to call and tell him you can't go. Cause it's six hours away. Um, like all said and done. So if he had gone, I couldn't just call him later and tell him to come back because there's a chance he may not make it. Um, and so he stayed and the contractions started to pick up. Um, initially they just kind of felt like period cramps and then, um, they just, they started, they started to get a little closer together, a little more intense. And my, again, we have no family and I had my toddler, um, and we were in a strange city and we're not used to things like rush hour. So around five o'clock is when my contractions picked up enough that I told my husband, you know, we, we need to find somewhere for Hudson to go stay. And so my friend that I had been staying with offered to take him for me. And so my husband left into rush hour and I had no idea. So I was alone in this rental house and I decided to go have a bath. So I got in the bath, I called my midwife and I let her know that things were, things were picking up. And she kind of just listened to me breathe, um, on the phone. And I think she was just trying to gauge was I entering active labor? Was it still early labor? And she told me just to breathe through them and to, and to stay at the rental house. Um, and it got to a point, I always explain it like this. It kind of feels like severe diarrhea cramps. Um, it goes from period cramps to these like severe diarrhea cramps. And it was getting so bad that I was feeling nauseous and I couldn't stand Um, and again, that back labor, oh my God, it was just, it was worse than anything I was feeling in the front. Um, it was very, very overwhelming. And again, no coping mechanisms in place. So I called one of my friends who was also evacuated to come get me because my husband was stuck in the rush hour. And I said, I I'm alone and I need to get to the hospital. Like I can't, this is, this is like very intense And so she said, okay, I'm on my way. And then little did I know her and my husband had called each other and said, how close are you to Taylor? Because I'm stuck in traffic. Uh, and they were both stuck in traffic. So here I was for an hour and a half, um, alone in this strange house. And things were like really picking up for me. Um, my friend finally made it. And she put me into her vehicle and same thing. This is a new city to her. So she had no idea where she was going. So she put her brother-in-law on speaker and he directed us where to go to get to the hospital. And man, oh man, I just remember that car ride being, um, very, very intense. 
Um, and we finally got there. My husband was there. He was waiting. The midwife had, had gotten there. Someone called her and said, no, we're going to the hospital. And my eyes were closed the entire time. They got me into a wheelchair. They started to wheel me into the hospital. And I remember I grabbed the midwife and I said, I need the epidural. Like I can't do this. And they wheeled me up the entire time my eyes were closed. I have no idea what floor we were on or what that hospital even looked like. And as soon as we got in, they checked me and I was six centimeters. um, And I was very ready for the epidural. So I got the epidural and it again took a few tries, but it worked. Um, And then tensions just kind of left the room. Everyone was a lot more calm. Um, I wasn't in pain. And I finally opened my eyes and was like, oh, hello, thank you for coming. Everyone's here. Um, And so the midwife had told me that the baby was still sunny side up. And so she had me try a few different positions on the hospital bed. Um, And just for time of reference, this was probably closer to um, like seven, seven or eight o'clock. And the rest of my labor was, um, it felt uneventful to me, but my midwife is now my friend. And she says that it was a little bit crazy that the baby's heart rate did some crazy things. They had to bolus me, uh, twice with IV fluid. I'm assuming because my blood pressure dropped. Um, but I just felt in la la land, I felt great that I wasn't having a scheduled C-section. And I think part of the reason why I didn't, um, prepare or cope to deal with labor this time was because I think mentally, I just assumed that I was going to have another C-section. Mm-hmm. I just assumed a VBAC wasn't even a possibility because for 38 weeks, my OB was telling me it wasn't. And I think subconsciously that really played a huge part. And so I didn't, I didn't prepare for anything other than most likely a C-section. And here I was on my way to having a vaginal birth and I was just excited. So I still look back on that birth and think that it was great. But in reality, there were a few things going on that, um, were concerning. Um, so it came time to push And the midwife checked and he was still sunny side up. He hadn't turned. Um, And because of his, whatever was happening with his heart rate, she asked the OB on that floor to come assist. And so he walked in and he was this like really gruff, almost biker gang looking guy. He had like a beard. I think he had a beard. I could be delusional, but I think he had a beard and he was just like, and he said to me, I'm going to turn this baby and you're going to have to push really hard after that. Cause he's not going to like it. And so he did, he went in and he manually rotated the baby's head and you could audibly hear the baby's heart rate drop. And so everyone was like, okay, very serious. Now, now you have to push, like you have to get this baby out. Um, and I took that very seriously. So I gave it my all. I pushed as hard as I could and it really didn't take that much once he had, he was turned and I was pushing. Um, I think I pushed for a total of, of five minutes. Um, with the epidural, I felt a lot of pressure, but I didn't feel any immense amount of pain. Um, yeah, and so once his head was out, uh, I pushed out his shoulders and I thought I was done. And they're like, no, no, his, his torso is still in there. You got to give a little, a little bit of, mm. and so I gave another little, mm, and out his body came and he was my biggest baby. He was almost nine pounds. Um, and onto my chest, he came and I was just like the weight of his little body on my chest. Um, after having such an awful experience before, it just, it felt like nothing else mattered in the world. And it was just so beautiful. My husband was crying. My friend who had drove me, she was there the whole time videotaping everything. 
and the midwife was there. The OB was there. I was just surrounded by people who were truly happy for me that I had had this experience that I still hold dear to my heart. And I just, I keep it as it went well, even though there were parts of it that maybe didn't, but it was good. Awesome. All right. Well, I know we have one more birth story to hear and it's just in line with your others and has some crazy moments too. So uh, let's hear about how that went for you. Yeah. So, um, I waited a few more years to get pregnant again. And I really quickly, before I got pregnant with my third, um, that is when I built my business. That is when I was like, wait a second. Cause I had that, you know, not so great experience. And then I had a much better one with birth and breastfeeding. And I thought, I want to help mothers have the better experience. And that's when my eyes really opened and this like passion exploded inside me. And I became certified in everything that I could possibly become certified in. Um, and one of those being uh, spinning babies. So I'm a parent spinning babies educator. And um, it was very important to me to, before I had another baby, to have this knowledge of spinning babies because I did not want to labor another baby ever in my life that was sunny side up. Um, so I, that was truly important to me. And it's funny cause that's actually where I found out that I was pregnant with my third was at the spinning babies conference in, um, Boston. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. And so, uh, pregnant with my third baby boy, the pregnancy went great, but, um, this time I knew 100% I was not going to have my baby in the hospital with the OBs in Fort McMurray. I just couldn't do it, especially because now, um, not only my personal experience, but, um, I'm a very busy doula. So I have been to so many births at the hospital with those OBs and I just, I knew I wanted different for myself. So the city that was five hours away, I found a midwife group there and, um, a midwife that took me on, even with me being so far away, uh, I would drive down for my appointments every now and then. And my plan was to drive down three weeks before my due date and just live in a cottage that I had rented. Um, so that was the plan, but the baby had a different plan. And so, uh, my water broke just like my first baby and just like my first baby, it was 10 days before my due date. So a little unexpected, I was planning to leave the very next day and, uh, yeah, it broke in the night. It was a stormy, stormy night. I got up to go pee and I felt, uh, some of the mucus plug come out and then some water. And I thought, Oh God, Oh God, my water is breaking. That's my water and my plug. This is happening. And again, no contraction. So I immediately kind of went to that first experience thinking, this is not happening to me. I'm in Fort McMurray and my water broke and I have no contractions. This is like a redo of my first birth. And like, there's just no way that this can happen to me again. Um, so my mom, I just became so determined in my mind. Um, that whole night, uh, I stayed up and I was, I think I was kind of nervous. So I was having diarrhea, but also, you know, pre-labor diarrhea. And my husband was working night shift. So I was trying to call him, trying to call him and he wasn't answering his phone. I was like, Oh my God. Okay. As soon as he's, he's done his night shift, we are leaving. So that night I packed up my minivan. I let my kids sleep. And, um, as soon as my husband got home from his night shift, I said, the van is packed. We're leaving. I'm in labor. And he's like, uh, say what we're doing? What? I was like, yeah, we're going to Edmonton right now. And he thought I was crazy. And I was a little bit crazy. Um, but that was, that was the only option in my mind. Um, my midwife did advise me that I should go to the hospital first to get checked, but, I just knew that if I went, they'd make me feel bad about my decision. Um, and I didn't want any excuse to stay. So I just was like, no, no, I'm not having contractions. I'm just going like I'm going. And so I put on a couple pairs of Depends and packed my kids in the van and I started driving. My husband was going to be about an hour and a half behind me because he still had to pack up a bunch of his stuff. And I said, that's fine. 
I'll call you if something crazy happens. And so off I went and I drove again, way too fast. Um, but I was determined to get there and my kids were so well behaved. They totally knew what was happening. Um, and then I got to Edmonton, um, for this birth, I had two doulas because I now as a doula myself value very much the support that they bring to the table. And, uh, so I went to one of my doulas houses and my contractions still hadn't started. So my water broke at three, um, and they hadn't started. I got to Edmonton around like noon. Um, I had some food. I laid my kids down for a nap. I did breast stimulation. I did spinning babies. I did like all the things that you can do. And then I went and had a nap and I, I spoke to the baby. I was like, you know what? We're safe now. Like maybe the baby was holding off or my body was holding off because I, I just was in fight or flight mode and I knew that it wasn't quite safe right then to have my baby, that the baby had to wait. And so I just had this little, little, you know, message with my baby saying it's safe now to come now. I'm ready for you. And then I had a nap. I woke up, I did the midwife brew, which is uh, castor oil, almond butter, and like a pulpy juice. And I chugged it. And then I put it down on the table. As soon as I put it down, I had my first contraction. So I labored at my doula's house, um, you know, with my headphones on, with my TENS machine, kind of doulaing myself. Like no one was really around me the entire time. They just, they gave me the space to do what I had to do. And then around eight o'clock, things were picking up. So I put my kids to bed at her house um, and then came back down and I said, you know, I think it's time to go but no one really believed me. And I think it's because I had prepared so immensely, uh, for coping this time that I seemed too calm to be as far along as I was. Um, but I knew I could feel him moving in my pelvis. I knew that it was time to go, but the midwife and the doulas, they said, no, why don't you go sit on the toilet? I was like, okay, okay, I guess I'll do, I'll do that. So I went and sat on the toilet and that's when things like really started to ramp up and I had no back labor and man, oh man, what a difference it makes to not have back labor. And, um, at that point I, I made like a mental note, like, nope, uh, I have to go now. Otherwise I can have the baby in the car. And so I just got up and I walked out the door and everyone else followed And into the vehicle we got, and my husband drove me to the birthing center. At this point, I think it was quarter after 10 at night. Um, And yeah, I labored on the side of the bed. I started feeling a lot of pressure in my pelvis, and I just really focused on my music and the TENS machine and my breathing. And at some point, someone thought to call the birth photographer, thank God. And so she ended up making it. Um, the midwife filled the bathtub for me and I got in and within like a couple minutes of being in that tub, I just instinctively started to bear down. Um, I know a lot of people explain kind of what that fetal ejection reflex feels like. Um, and I think it feels just like vomiting, but out of your vagina, like you just can't help it. And going to so many births where I see moms have drug-free labors and they have that fetal ejection reflex. I so badly wanted to see myself what that feels like. And I got to see what that feels like. And it was very unreal. Like it almost feels good to push. Um, and no one, it was very hands-off. Like everyone just left me to do my thing in the tub Um, I didn't feel like anyone was touching me. No one was doing anything and I was just bearing down and everyone was just protecting my space and making me feel safe enough to follow my body and let my body do what it was doing. I could feel the baby's head coming. And at that point I, I yelled out to everyone, the baby's head is coming. Um, and what's so crazy to me is my contractions stopped at like maximum crowning. And 
yes, it burned. The burning ring of fire is very real. Um, but my body knew to pause at that moment to let myself stretch. And I just knelt in the, in the tub with the baby's head crowned. And then with the next contraction, again, I just followed my body and the rest of his head came. And then I kind of rolled over in the tub and everyone could see the baby's head. Um, and I remember I had originally planned on wanting to catch the baby myself. Um, and so I put my hand down to, to grab, like to touch his head and I felt his body, um, kind of like twitch inside me. And that, that part kind of freaked me out a bit. I was like, Oh my gosh. And so I took my hand away and they said, do you want someone else to catch your baby? And I said, yes. Um, and my husband volunteered. He's like, I'll do it. I'll do it. Um, and so I still had my headphones on. I couldn't really hear what everyone was saying, but the midwife was giving a little bit of instruction to my husband. And what's beautiful is they didn't rush the birth of the baby's body after the baby's head was born, which is natural. You want to wait for like the power of a contraction to help push that baby's head. As long as the gap between baby's head being born and baby's torso isn't too far apart. And, and it was so supportive. They just waited until my next contraction. I told them it was coming. And with that next contraction, I, I bared down and my body like contorted the way it was supposed to, to increase my pelvic outlet. And the baby's body was born and my husband picked him up out of the water and put him on my chest. And he was just so perfect. Um, we stimulated him. We put a towel on him and rubbed him. He started to cry. He started to pink up. And it was just, I couldn't believe I had done it. I was like, oh my, I, I can't believe I just did that. Like I just did that. <laughs> and he was born at quarter after 11. So I had only been at the birthing center for, I think, less than an hour. So I'm really lucky I made it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And after all of that, like leaving Fort McMurray and then getting to the birthing center and having this birth that I truly, really wanted to experience, I was just in awe that it happened. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. So many amazing stories. I feel like this is such a great episode for people who live in rural, like more rural areas or just have less options because yeah. you're a really good example of all the different ways that can can work out. Um, do you want to share anything from your postpartum experience real quickly? Sure. One thing, yeah. So right after I had him, we, we went back <laughs> to my friend's house and slept on an air mattress in her living room. And that also blew my mind. I'm like, what? Like we left three hours later and then here I am sleeping on an air mattress in my friend's house with my newborn baby. Like it just blew my mind. Whereas my first birth, I was in the hospital for three days. Yeah. It was just very different. Like the very next day we went to Cora's for breakfast. I just baby wore the baby and we went to breakfast because again, we don't have a home there. So we went out to eat and, um, Overall, I just felt amazing. I didn't tear, um, and I attribute that to my following my body, and I, it just felt so good. Um, breastfeeding did go great, um, and I think, again, because now I'm an IBCLC, I have that knowledge. Um, but one thing, you know, for healthcare professionals out there, sometimes uh, like your, your midwife or other nurses or any other, you know, care or support, it's almost sometimes assumed that you'll be okay because you know what you're doing. And I was okay, but I did, I did still struggle breastfeeding this baby. Um, not right away, but eventually I did. And it just kind of was like, I think everyone assumes that I don't need any help because I'm an IBCLC and I shouldn't need any help. But when it's your own baby, it, it makes a difference. It's just like, you, you still need support. Like even an IBCLC needs support. I feel like even, you know, if a midwife were to have a baby, she'd need support. So it did go better, but you know, I, I struggled with supply and, uh, that was, um, a hurdle that I had to overcome because, because I, 
am a lactation consultant. It killed me to struggle with supply. And it bothered me to have to top him up with a little bit of formula. When in reality, I know like that's, it, I shouldn't feel bad about it. I did it with my other children as well. Um, but I think because I have all of these people that look up to me as an IBCLC, I felt like I was letting them down almost. Um, not so much my baby necessarily, but other people. Um, but yeah, overall I recovered great and, um, we just finished breastfeeding and he is now 14 months old. So, um, he self weaned, uh, on world breastfeeding week, funny enough. And yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. All right. Well, thanks for sharing that. And then if you have any resources to share, maybe just send those over to me and I'll put them on your show notes page, but I do want to have you share where people can connect with you online. Perfect. Um, I'm a Facebooker. I prefer Facebook. So my professional Facebook page is Mamasaurus. It's M-A-M-A-S-A-U-R-S. And um, on Instagram, it's Mamasaurus Coach is my handle. But I prefer messages on Facebook. So if anyone wants to reach out for any support, please do. And um, I do post stuff every day on there that helps with birth, breastfeeding, newborn stage. Yeah. All right. Great. Well, we'll link to those too, in case anybody has trouble finding them. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories today. Thank you for having me. Now I'm going to chat with Brandy from Ergo Baby, today's sponsor. Hi, Brandy. Welcome to the birth hour. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today to talk to me about Ergo Baby and all things baby wearing. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. (laughs) So much fun. (laughs) All right. Well, can you tell my listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do at Ergo Baby? Yes. So my name is Brandy Sellers Jackson. I'm a social media manager over at Ergo Baby. So what that looks like is, you know, myself and Christina Saletti, we create content that is about baby wearing, obviously Ergo products, but then also what that looks like uh, within parenting. So we cover everything, obviously, from baby wearing basics to tips. Like we have a Tips Tuesday to, you know, how can I get my little one to sleep and how can I get things done? You know, how how does that work? And how can I have some free hands? And so enter Ergo Baby. So we, we try to combine all of those things, you know, just to make everyone's lives a little bit easier during this hashtag parent life. (laughs) Yeah. So I've been a fan of Ergo Baby products for, I guess, coming up on a decade now. Um, And I just love the function and they're beautiful and they work really well. But I also love the brand and how you guys really put so much effort into focusing on the benefits of baby wearing and And like you said, even just expanding beyond that into supporting parents through parenthood. And I really love your most recent um, Why Baby Wear series, which is a hashtag for those of you that are into hashtags. Um, Can you talk a little bit about those efforts and then just some of those favorite benefits of baby wearing that you guys are covering with that? Yeah, there are a few things. You know, one of my favorites is obviously you get stuff done. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I mean, with a lot of us who, you know, whether you have one baby or 20 babies, <laughs> three can feel like 20, right. <laughs> um, you know, especially now during COVID, I mm-hmm. think, you know, all of us are so like quarantined in, it can feel overwhelming. You know, you have kids who are remote learning, but then also you have a, a toddler who's just really fussy and just wants to be held, you know, or you have a little one, a, a newborn who needs to be held, you know, it can be really uh, challenging. And so One of my favorite benefits is that you're able to get some things done. You're able to multitask. (laughs) You're able to be hands-free. And one of the things that I've always said, too, about baby wearing that I've always loved is that, you know, especially when you're in those newer, the throes of postpartum, new, like new baby, you can begin to feel like you're just this extension of another person and that you're actually not a person. Mm -hmm. Um, You don't know when the last time you took a shower, when was the last time that you brushed your teeth. And all those things, you don't even know when was the last time you went to the bathroom. Right. And and those things being because you are literally holding a little person all the time. And so the beauty in baby wearing is that you have your hands free and hands, you know, they can we can go and make ourselves a meal. We can go, you know, wash a dish or two. We can brush our teeth. We can, you know, 
I don't know, whatever you use for your hands. And (laughs) it reminds yourself that you're a human and you're a person. And, you know, just that connection of getting things done, being able to multitask, doing things that you did before. And so um, I I think that's one of the many benefits of baby wearing, just being hands free. Obviously, there's tummy time. You know, a lot of people stress about getting tummy time in and baby wearing actually allows you to get your tummy time in. Right. So you're you're doing all the things you're getting stuff done. You're getting tummy time done. You're building a connection with your little one. Um, there's so many. And then also obviously baby's able to see from your point of view and observe as opposed to, you know, just, you know, in a bassinet or in a crib or, you know, in the playpen, you know, you're able to put baby on you and talk with them as you're doing things, you know, whether you're making yourself some food or whether you're, you know, drawing or whatever it is working. I mean, so many of us are working right now from home, you know, you're able to talk to baby while you're doing it. And so, yeah, I guess if I could sum it up, you're able to, to connect with yourself by simply doing the things that you may have done before because you have some some free arms, you have some free hands, right. <laughs> you know. Um, but then also there's just uh, so many benefits to it that I just named. Yeah, I feel so, like yeah. it's kind of two categories. There's like the practicality of all the things you can get done and just um, – and the the tummy time, getting that in because babies like to be baby weared and they generally hate <laughs> tummy time. So that's a nice trade off. But there's also a lot of research too around like um, benefits of, with bonding and um, and that type of thing as well, right? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when you're baby wearing, baby is on you. So, you know, there's, I always say skin to skin, you know, even if you have on a sweater, that's fine. But you know, baby is on you. They're mm-hmm. connected to you. They can hear your heartbeat. You can feel them breathing. They can feel you breathing, you know, and you know, there's so many benefits of it. You're, you're literally attached. So, yeah. I mean, <laughs> Attachment there's, <parenting>. there's that, <laughs> yeah, there's that finest, you know, yeah. I've, I, I mean, for those of us who live here in, you know, California or anywhere right now, that's just ridiculously hot. Mm-hmm. I always tell folks, Hey, listen, skin to skin, skin to skin with the, with the, with the carrier, just y'all just walk around, just skin to skin. It's hot. It's whatever. Yep. So, <laughs> you know, I think it's, uh, it's, it's just such a win-win. Definitely. Yeah. I always liked, I had, uh, my first baby was a winter baby. And so I was worried about, you know, keeping her warm as well as like flu season and keeping people's hands off of her. And I feel like now, you know, flu season is kind of year round with COVID and it's just a nice way to keep baby close and not have to worry about the outside world as much because people feel very sometimes entitled to get in your baby's face when they're in a stroller, but they're probably not going to get in your face when baby's two inches from it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge benefit. I mean, I, for sure, when you have baby on you, who is that person who's just all up in your bubble space like that? Who's that person (laughs) who, you know, who's just like all up in there? Like, (laughs) although I will say this, I did experience it one time. I was wearing Uh uh, my middle child um, and I had them in, I had them in a carrier and, um, there's just one person. It's never happened besides this one person who literally was trying to get all up in the carrier to look at the baby. And I was oh like, gosh. really? Wow. <laughs> You're being that person right now. You're that person. I've never experienced that. And you've never forgotten now. it. <laughs> I've never forgotten it. I've never forgotten it ever. And their, their face is seared in my brain because of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's um, quite alarming. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to ask you a probably a hard question with how familiar you are with Ergo Baby products, but do you have a favorite carrier just personally? Mm, let's see. Honestly, I would say the classic. I feel like every Ergo and Baby person I talk to says that. It's so classic. funny. The OG. Yeah, the classic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love facing out. It's great. It's mm-hmm. wonderful. You know, depending on the baby, some babies absolutely love it. There's some babies that are like, yeah, this is just like so much. Right. Um, but I love the classic. It's just I my first carrier that I had from Ergo that I received from Ergo was uh, their organic mm-hmm. um, cotton carrier. And it was just the normal, the the basic, the first one. And it was just amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. And so, I mean, that's my favorite hands down. I love all the I love the new one. Obviously, I love Harry Potter. I love 
the 360. I love the Omni. I love the Adapt. They just keep keep getting, we keep getting better and better. Mm-hmm. Um, but of my favorite, if I had a favorite child, it would be, <laughs> <laughs> it would be the classic. I just, I like it. I dig it. Yeah. So Well, I feel you yeah. on that. We still have our original organic navy blue carrier too. And I yeah. recently talked to Nellie who helped launch the Everlove program with Ergo Baby. And I was like, oh, maybe yeah. I should be, you know, passing this on to another family. But I don't know if I'm yeah. ready to yet. But I just love that program. No, have you heard true. any cool stories about that yet from people that have done it? Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I just agree with you. I agree. There's nothing like the OG, the Mm -hmm. original, there's nothing like it. Um, yeah, there are quite a few people that are, I think sometimes people do struggle with passing it on because it's like, there's so many memories and so many memories. But the beauty of it is that when you pass it along, you know, it goes to another family and they're able to start their own adventure, which I think is absolutely beautiful. Um, and our, just to speak to our Everlove program, basically, it's a, a, a recycling program, mm-hmm. you know, but with carry, a carrier. So what it looks like is, you know, you have your carrier, your OG carrier, original, you know, the classic. Mm-hmm. And, you know, baby is now like 25. And <laughs> <laughs> you're like, okay, so I can't baby wear them anymore. I, I don't think I can baby wear a 25 year old anymore. And so you <laughs> find out about our Everlove program and you're like, okay, this might be up my alley. I think it's time to release it to another family. And so basically we come and we pick it up. You know, we have, you know, postal service that comes and picks it up and then, you know, we make it nice and new. So we, you know, sanitize, we, you know, if there's anything that's broken on it, we replace it. And then say, for example, it is just like a carrier that, has run its course because that has happened too, where it's just like, okay, so, okay, girl. Okay. So (laughs) we, we can't do nothing with this. (laughs) There's nothing. There's nothing. It has been loved, loved very well. Um, and then if that's the case, then obviously we won't use it, but if it's salvageable and it's reusable, you know, we make it nice and new and then it goes up on our site to our, uh, ever love, uh, re-commerce program. So basically families can, you know, buy from that collection, um, the refurbished collection, and it's at a lower price point, which is wonderful. And, you know, you have an Ergo Baby Carrier that's been loved and pre-loved and has, you know, a story and a history behind it and it's affordable. So that's the long and the short of it. Yeah. I love that on the sentimental note too, Nellie was telling me that you can actually send like a note with your carrier yep. to pass on to the yep. next family, just about what it meant to you and everything, which yep. probably isn't for everyone, but it did make me kind of like a little emotional to think about. So I love that you guys have started yeah. that. It's very cool. Yeah, it's really beautiful. I mean, I think a lot of our carriers, as with a lot of our baby products, but I think specifically our care with carriers, there are a lot of memories. You know, if you think back to any carrier that you've had or ergo baby carrier specifically, you can probably think of all the adventures where you've been, you know, where yeah. you took a trip and you took the ergo baby carrier, where you, you know, were having, you know, a fun family gathering. We were all able to gather and you had the ergo baby carrier. The first time you put your baby in a carrier, you know, hard moments in the carrier, you know, yeah, those I was just are thinking about that. like struggling in the airport bathroom. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You know, and all those memories come rushing back. Yeah. Um, and so it's, it's really, really, really beautiful. It really is. And just to, to share that love via something that you and your family were able to benefit from, I think it's just such a wonderful, wonderful thing. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, thank you so much, Brandy, for chatting with me today. This was so fun. Thank you for having me. I've, I'm always down to talk babies and parenting and all that jazz. <laughs> can you tell people where they can find you? Because you are always sharing amazing content on your personal account as well. Love it. Yes, you can find me at B Stereo on Instagram. Just B as in boy and then stereo. Um, yeah. And then obviously, you know, Ergo Baby, I'm always thinking of cool things to put out there. <laughs> Very cool. And people can use the why baby wear hashtag as well to share their stories, or do you have a better hashtag for them to use? Why baby wear is absolutely perfect. It just encompasses okay. everything. So yeah. Very cool. All right. Thanks again, Brandy. Thank you so much for having me.
Thank you so much again to Tayla for sharing her birth stories with us and to Brandy for chatting with me about Ergo Baby. If you want more information from today's episode, you can head over to thebirthhour.com and search for Tayla's name in the search bar. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.